Good morning, and welcome one and all to this virtual service at First Congregational Church of Houston. We want you to know that whoever you are, or wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We say at First Congregational Church every Sunday that we are an open church, and so we are a church that is open and welcome to all people. So we welcome you to join us today, whether you are someone who is very much firm in your faith, or still questioning things and, and consider yourself a seeker. We welcome you regardless of who you love, what your race or gender or age are. We welcome you to be with us so that together, even though we're not here in the same space, we can lift up our voices collectively and give praise to God. Now, one thing I want to say before we begin is that uh, to help you in this virtual service, we have a bulletin that you can download if you haven't done so already. You can find it on our homepage or you can find it on the email that got sent to you about this service. Speaking of which, if you are a visitor today with us at First Congregational, we encourage you to go to the website and sign up for our email list. That way you can stay in touch and learn about all the things that are going on, even in this time of coronavirus. And now, let us sing. thy servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden and through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing whither we go, but only that thy hand is leading us and thy love supporting us. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls, and all the rest of you who are young at heart. I'm glad to see you all. And I thought this morning we would talk a little bit about families. Now, some of you live in big families and some of you live in small families. 
Uh, how many of you have brothers? And anybody have sisters? And how many of you are only children? Right, well families are all very different, but in some ways they're all the same. People in families have various interests and talents. You might like to play with trains or build with Legos or go for bike rides. Um, and some of these things you might do by yourself and some you might do with your family. But you can also do lots of things to help your family, like make your bed and pick up your toys and maybe you could help cook or bake cookies. We do things because we love one another and we care for one another. Well, the church has a big family too, and it works very much the same way. There are lots of different people with lots of interests and talents. Some people like to come and make music. Some people like to teach. Some people are very friendly and they like to welcome people and make them feel comfortable at church. And they all come to learn about Jesus and ways that we can live out the things that he's taught us to do and ways that we can help people in our community. We heard about the early church this morning in the scripture reading, and the early church was very much the same. There were people who were very unique. They had different talents and different skills, but they all came together and followed the apostles to learn more about Jesus and how to help one another and share what they had. So this week, I'd like you to think about all the ways that you can help ways that you can follow the teachings of Jesus and ask others in your family how they help and how they follow the teachings of Jesus. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for making each of us unique. Be with us and show us ways to use our interests and our talents to help others. Help us to care for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning with verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Here ends our reading. And now, please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Reading through this passage in Acts 2, I wonder what it must have been like, what those in early Jerusalem must have thought of the early church those 2,000 years ago. Here were these followers of Jesus, you kept running into them amidst the narrow, hot streets of Jerusalem. 
Why were they following that man, Jesus? That man had died. The people of Jerusalem had witnessed the spectacle firsthand just two months before. Jesus was dead, and yet these people, they kept meeting. Some of their neighbors undoubtedly knew them. Jeremiah had grown up just down the street. He heard about Jesus when he came to town for Passover. Jeremiah had been one of the throng that went out to see him and wave palm branches. And now, and now he was joining that group for their meetings. Something seemed different about Jeremiah now, though. He had this glow in his face and a joy that seemed infectious whenever he spoke of Jesus. Now Jeremiah was even helping the lame man who begged every day near the south gate. He brought him food and listened to him. Seeing what happened to Jeremiah brought awe and wonder. And the numbers of this Jesus movement, the numbers kept growing. First it was just a couple dozen men and women. Now it seemed like hundreds would gather and pray and sing. You could hear them down the street. Most remarkable of all, there were rumors of them sharing their possessions with one another. Think about it. It was as though the community mattered more than the individual. Isaiah the, Isaiah the sandal maker was one of them too. He'd always been so tight-fisted with his money and now he was freely giving it to the widows in that Jesus group. As much as the other residents of Jerusalem hated to admit it, there was something about this Jesus movement. These people laughed together and cried together. As time went on, more and more became curious. And it seemed whenever someone showed up to their meetings, mostly out of curiosity, that person would keep going back. Something about that group was irresistible. Even those who looked down their noses at these worshipers of a dead man had to admit that there was something special about this movement. The ecclesia, the congregation of followers, kept growing and growing. Where would it all lead? What would come of the church in a year, in ten years, in a thousand? It was anyone's guess back then. It's fascinating for us to look back at this early Jesus movement. This is what started it all. We have it here in these verses. This was the beginning of the church. All wasn't going to be smooth sailing for the early church. If we just read these few verses at the end of Act 2, we could miss that. Over the next few chapters in Acts, we see the apostles first run in with the authorities, and eventually the martyrdom of Stephen in Acts 7. But even in the face of those obstacles, the church continued to grow and thrive. Why? What was it that made the early church grow? What was the secret to its success? This is a question that concerns churches at any time, but it's especially oppressing now in a time of change. What makes for good church? What do we focus on? What should our emphasis be even now? Acts 2 gives us an answer. According to this text, it's three basic things. And we read about them in verse 42. Three things turn the church from a collection of Jesus followers into the church, full of awe and wonders. Those three things are the apostles' teaching, fellowship, and the breaking of the bread and prayers. So what did that mean for them? The apostles' teaching, fellowship, and breaking of the bread and prayers. Sadly, we don't have a list of what those apostles' teachings were. <laughs> That would be a preacher's dream. Can you imagine? I could just read those out and then sit down, although some of you might want me to just sit down anyway. The one hint we do have as to what the apostles' teachings were comes to us in the form of Peter's sermon that he delivers just before this passage. Peter's sermon in Acts 2 is known as the first sermon in Christian history. It's a remarkable document. If you recall, the Holy Spirit descends on the disciples on Pentecost at the beginning of Acts 2, and they begin speaking intelligibly in other languages. The people who observe this phenomenon question whether the disciples are just drunk. And of course, this always makes me laugh because I've never seen a drunk person spontaneously speak fluently in a new foreign language, but such is life. Peter gets up to defend the disciples 
and explains that the event that everyone witnessed at Pentecost is actually the descent of the Holy Spirit, as it was promised by the prophet Joel. Peter goes on to explain how Jesus is the new Davidic Messiah, which was confirmed by his glorious resurrection. The essence of this sermon, this particular apostle's teachings, is threefold. First, the followers of Jesus have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Get used to seeing amazing things happen as a result of it. Second, Jesus has opened up the gates of heaven. Eternal life is a thing. Do not be afraid of death because it no longer has its power. And third, that Jesus is the one. He's the man. Presumably that meant you should listen to what he said during his life. I can imagine the teachings of the apostles included all these things and probably a lot more. No wonder why the new community shared its possessions in common and gave aid to those in need. As Jesus said to them, people will know they are his disciples by the love they show one another. And they did just that. Now, fellowship was the second key of the church, the second thing that was a secret to the early church's success. The Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. Koinonia comes from the root verb to share. Those who are in fellowship with one another are those who share. It also has the connotation of generosity of spirit. That's what fellowship entailed for the early church. It wasn't simply spending time together, it was about sharing. When you give a gift, when you give a gift of your time to help someone, when you engage in deep spiritual sharing, you are engaging in koinonia. That is something that we all know well. I've seen it happen countless times in the past five years at FCC. It happens when people have contributed to the Benevolence Fund during this crisis or in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. It comes when you have shared your personal stories with one another, the joys as well as the pains of life. It's those connections that speak of something deeper and more meaningful than most interactions that we have in life. It's sharing your time to prepare for a funeral reception. It's sharing your time when someone is grieving. It's even sharing your skills at making chili or donating to the silent auction for the youth group. It's sharing your musical talents or leading Sunday school. When we do these things, when we engage in fellowship, in the sharing of ourselves, something special happens. And others can see it. When someone walked into the meeting house on Sunday morning, or when someone could do that before this crisis, that person could sense that the members of FCC actually know one another. That's one thing that I've heard visitors to the church say to me again and again. That is one thing that the church, that a church that's the size of FCC can do so well. We engage in fellowship, in koinonia, in sharing of ourselves like the early church. The final thing that Luke tells us in Acts that the early church did was to break bread and to pray. Now, breaking bread was not simply the sharing of a meal. It was a ritual action of breaking the bread, which Jesus commanded his disciples to do at the Last Supper. In the Gospel of Luke, which is the companion to Acts, Jesus is made known to his disciples in that action of breaking the bread. The action is liturgical, but it also invites Jesus' presence into the community. That's what happens when we worship God. We invite Jesus into our lives and into our space. We are reminded of God's presence, something that we so often forget. It's something that we need. It brings with it a sense of God's peace, wholeness. And praying is crucial too. When we pray for others, when we pray for our world, when we pray for our enemies and ourselves, that act of praying changes us. It heals us and grounds us in God. Those three simple things, the apostles' teachings, fellowship, and worship, that is what is needed for the church to be healthy and grow. If we can do those three things well, we can be like the early church. Awe would come upon us as it did for them when we witness the signs and wonders that those three things can bring about. Now, there is a huge body of literature on church growth and vitality. I can show you a whole shelf of books in my library 
on church growth. And yet, when you read them through, they all boil down to this simple model that we have in these short verses from Acts. What's interesting to reflect on is how this time we're in, this time that we're living through, has affected those three things for us. How have things changed, become clearer or more difficult as a result of this coronavirus? I think about the apostles' teachings. The New Testament is full of teachings that warn us about materialism. We are told to worship God and not mammon. We are told not to worry excessively about material things. We are called on to give of our possessions to others. If this current crisis has shown us anything, it has shown us that we can get by just fine without the constant drive to consume. Here we are, stuck at home. We can order things online, and I know some people who've been doing a lot of that recently, but for most people, our consumption has gone way down these past seven weeks. And do we miss it? Do we miss the shopping, the new clothes? I, for one, don't miss it at all. What do I miss? I miss people. I miss interacting with people. I miss going to the gym. Spending money, though, not one bit. Another key teaching of the apostles is, is the importance of community. We live in a society that lauds the individual. It's about individual accomplishments, individual ambition. We are all on our own, according to society. We have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We're measured by what we do as individuals. Christianity, on the other hand, has always emphasized the collective. It's about the congregation, the community. We see that so clearly here in our reading from Acts. And what is it that we miss now? Do we miss being rugged individuals off on our own? Not at all. We miss community. We also come together as a community during hard times. It is during a crisis like this one, or Hurricane Harvey, when the fiction of the American individual is laid bare for all to see. We realize how profound the teachings of the apostles were and how relevant they are today. This is something that annoys me so much about those protesting stay-at-home orders or those who refuse to wear face masks in the grocery store. They seem to think that their individual freedom to do what they want should trump the community's safety. It angers me because it angers me and many others because it's so selfish. We need to do this together. We're in this together. Let's do what's right for the whole community, for our health and prosperity. We have to make those decisions as a community because our decisions affect the whole community. Again, it's not about the individual, and we're seeing that now. And the same thing true holds true for the Christian value of love and self-sacrificial love. We rightfully applaud our healthcare workers, especially those in New York City, and the brave work that they've done, particularly at the beginning of this crisis, when we didn't have enough personal protective equipment for our doctors and nurses. The love shown to others matters more than some other values that society often prioritizes. Our love shown to those in need, our love shown to our friends, these are the things that matter. And then there's the importance of truth. We long for truth during this time. We want our politicians to tell us the truth, even if it's the hard truth. We want what the apostles taught. Coronavirus has re-emphasized the, re the teachings of the apostles in a way that I won't soon forget. And think about the value of fellowship at this time. It goes without saying that Zoom calls are not the same as being with one another in person. But the sharing of stories, the sharing of humor and artistic talent, the sharing of resources for others, these manifestations of fellowship have been more important than at any other time that I can remember. Think of the joy that that first time you could see a friend on your screen. I was positively on cloud nine the first time I could connect with old friends and with all of you even if just virtually. And this time apart has given me greater appreciation of the values of sharing in person. When this all got started, I was grateful for, for time alone. It's something that I don't get enough of on a regular basis. But now, now I can't wait to be in person. 
to go in person to plays and arts events, to be able to shake hands and hug, fellowship, glorious in-person fellowship. What a thing. The early church knew the true value of fellowship, and we see it now more than, more than any other time. Finally, we can look at the ways that coronavirus has changed worship. We've been able to reach people all over the country in a way that was not possible before, or at least that we didn't do before. And by the way, I'd like to give a big shout out to all of you who are watching this from someplace other than Houston. Thank you for tuning in. There have been those before all this happened who couldn't join us on Sunday morning, and now they're able to watch at any time. Boy, do I miss in-person worship. Trust me, as I stand here in the meeting house, I miss in-person worship. But I've also been able to go on more walks than ever before during this. Walks for me are a time of deep reflection and prayer. I've been able to read uninterrupted. What a joy that has been. Reading is another spiritual discipline of mine where I can connect with God. Reading is an expression of worship, as is the ways that we have prayed and reached out to others. The apostles' teachings, fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. These three things we need, both for a healthy church and a healthy spirituality. The question remains, have you been able to find those three things during this time? Have you been able to explore the apostles' teachings? Have you been able to think deeply about your faith? If not, join our Zoom adult Christian education class on Tuesday evenings. If you want some book recommendations, Send me an email or give me a call. Have you been able to set aside time for reading the Bible? Or that one book that's been calling you, calling to you from your bookshelf? Now's the time. Pick it up. Be the church during this time and engage in the apostles' teachings. How about fellowship? Have you been able to find a community or group with whom you can share? Share your gifts and talents? but also share your deepest needs and desires. Join one of our fellowship activities that, this, that are going on this upcoming week. Or set up a new fellowship activity yourself. Do you know that you can play bridge, the card game online, and other games as well? You can have online cooking classes uh, on Zoom. You can have online book study groups, online happy hours. You can share your time with the many opportunities that the mission board has at the end of our bulletin. You can share your resources or your skills at making face masks. So many opportunities exist for fellowship. And the question is, are you taking advantage of them? What about worship? Not only can you watch our services here, but you can browse through worship services and sermons of nearly any church across the country. Think about that. You could spend the whole week in worship if you'd like to. <laughs> There are also online tools to help with prayer and meditation. We have, a, we have our weekly midweek prayer service on Wednesdays at noon. Just go to our church's Facebook page and you'll see it at noon on Wednesday. I'll be there. Can you feel it? Can you feel the energy that comes with trying to be the church when you engage in these three different things? Even at this time, the horizon is limitless and so are the possibilities. Do you want awe to come upon you as you see the wonders of the church? The apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of the bread and prayers, it's that simple. Let's do it. Probably the most famous theologian of the 20th century is a Swiss guy named Karl Barth. He wrote a monumental systematic theology called Church Dogmatics. If you're looking for a collection to weigh down a full bookshelf, I'd recommend Church Dogmatics. In his section on the church, Karl Barth looks at the classic distinction between the visible and invisible church. The visible church is the one that shows up on Sunday mornings. It's the church you can see. The invisible church is the church of the saints, which, according to classic Christian theology, is a subset of the visible church. Karl Barth reinterprets this classic distinction. He says that the visible and invisible church are made up of the same people. What makes the difference between the two is when the Holy Spirit shows up. When the Holy Spirit is present, you have the true church, the invisible church, 
the saints in action. Well, the invisible church of Karl Barth is on full display in Acts 2. It's a church that's full of the Spirit. The fascinating thing about our time now is that we cannot be the visible church. We cannot gather on Sunday morning or take on the classic appearance of a church. But we still can be the invisible church. Though separated by distance, the Holy Spirit can bind us together through the apostles' teachings, fellowship, and worship. So let us aim to be the invisible church this week. Seek the presence of the Spirit, be the church of Acts, and rejoice in the glory of the Lord. I know I could use that uplift, that joy, that comes from being the church with all of you. Let us enter into a time of prayer. Let us pray for the apostles' teachings to come into our lives. God of the living word, give us the faith to receive your message, the wisdom to know what it means, and the courage to put it into practice. Amen. Let us pray for deeper fellowship with one another. Lord God, you have taught us that we are members one of another and that we can never live to ourselves alone. We thank you for the community of which we are a part, for those who share with us in its activities, and for all who serve its varied interests. Help us, as we have opportunity, to make our own contribution to the community, to connect with new people, and to learn to be good neighbors, that by love we may serve one another for the sake of Jesus the Christ. Amen. And let us pray for our life of worship and prayer. O God, thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless 
until they find rest in thee. We give thee thanks for this divine indwelling unrest. Help us so to trust its leadings that we fail not of the things which belong unto our peace. Holy Spirit, dwell in me that I may become prayer. Whether I sleep or wake, eat or drink, labor or rest, may the fragrance of prayer rise without effort in my heart. Purify my soul and never leave me, so that the movements of my heart and mind may, with voices full of sweetness, sing in secret to God. Amen. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, as it's printed in your order of service. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Ken McLaughlin. My partner Brad and I have been members of FCC for 19 years, and I could probably spend 19 years talking about why um, it's so important to us and what it means to us. But I was struck uh, as I was preparing to talk about this, um, about being really grateful for now. I'm being really grateful that we have a church as resilient as FCC and as innovative um, in a certain way of bringing us together. Um, these online services have just meant the world to me um, in this time of quarantine and to know um, how many members are working behind the scenes to make it possible that I'm even talking right now. Um, and I'm very moved by the thought that out there watching this at this moment on this morning, are so many people who are so dear to me and dear to our hearts. Um, our church definitely is a special place, uh, not only for its beautiful campus and beautiful meeting house, but for the beauty of that which connects us all. Um, and that's the love of this journey together as Christians. And it's a special place. And if you are visiting us, um, please continue to learn more about us. Uh, a warm welcome extends uh, from afar uh, to uh, connect us all. This is the moment where we consider what it is that we are able to give to support this ministry and support this work. Um, and we ask that you think fully about what's possible uh, and give with a generous heart to making the continued work of FCC possible. Um, we have some online um, resources and you can visit our website for those for giving. Our preferred method of giving is through Zelle. So thank you all for being with us this morning. Um, bless you wherever you are. And thank you to FCC for being the rock upon which we have stood for 19 years and continue to celebrate and stand. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one. We will work with each other, we will work side by 
side, and we'll guide each one's dignity and save each one's pride. And we'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, we'll know we are Christians by our love. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.